We're now moving on to chapter 45, and we're going to talk about uh, international transactions briefly. Uh, the key element of international transactions is that more and more small businesses are becoming international today. If you're on the internet and you're selling something, you can be just as well selling it in Italy or uh, in China as selling it here in the United States. Uh, the big issue, of course, is how you get it there and uh, also uh, how you do business across uh, many different governments, especially since there's no consistent international law. So one of the most important things you will do as a business person dealing internationally is to determine what law will be applied to the particular situation that you're dealing with. So that's, uh, that's one of the most important things. Um, a recent Texas case involves some confusion about how the uh, bill, uh, how the contract was put together. There's a choice of laws provision that's very confusingly written as to whether the law of the other country would apply or the law of the U.S. would apply. And the judge determined that, the, made a determination that despite the confusing approach, that it was set in such a way that he thought that the international, the other country's law should apply, dismissed the case completely out of the Texas court. Now that is a very atypical decision, especially in Texas. Texas judges historically are famous for saying, oh, it ha anything connected with Texas, it's a Texas case, but uh, not anymore. Uh, the other area is Texas became a popular dumping ground for plaintiff cases, big class action cases, because uh, even though we have a reputation of being a conservative state, um, the reality is, is that our plaintiff uh, bar system um, uh, allowed a lot of large uh, runaway uh, uh, verdicts. Uh, one of the most famous ones was the $8 million cow, and uh, an exterminator came out and was spraying a barn and the cow died, this is in the late 80s, and the uh, farmer, you know, this is probably a $500 cow on a good day, and the um, cow dies, and of course it, it was never tox, toxology report to say we're definitely spraying for bugs anyway, but in any event, the cow dies, a jury down there in Missouri County awards a million dollars for the cow, and uh, seven or eight million dollars in uh, punitive damages. And this award was upheld by the Texas Supreme Court. Well, that was kind of the high watermark because uh, within a few years, every single statewide judge was held by a Republican. Um, and we still didn't get tort reform, but relatively recently, uh, Texas has adopted some frameworks for tort reform. Primarily, again, we talked about this earlier this semester, we talked about liability considerations of risk, and uh, tort reform generally says that damages have to be demonstrable, and if you have demonstrated documented damages, the punitive damages must bear some relationship to the actual damages. So you're not going to get, you know, $8 million on a $1 million verdict, even and the $1 million is going to be subject to real scrutiny if it's for a $500 cow. So uh, a lot of interesting uh, issues there, but again, um, there was an attempt to bring cases from overseas into the Texas courts. Uh, the one that probably attracted the most attention, most of you are familiar with the fact that a old uh, a chemical plant, uh, I think it was Union Carbide in Bhopal, in, in India, um, had a, a late plant that had been closed for many years, and by the way, it was completely operated by natives of uh, there. It was not operated by the United States company. But in any event, there was uh, some uh, toxic gas trapped in the system. Somehow that gas was released and it poisoned the entire community. Uh, about 12,000 people either died or were seriously injured. It was a very, very serious loss. Uh, in any event, uh, India issued a criminal warrant for the president of Union Carbide, that wasn't going to happen anytime soon. And uh, Union Carbide said, it's a closed plant, your people are in charge, not our plant, tough luck. That didn't sell well, which is probably why they did the criminal indictment against.
was the president of Eden Carbide. Eventually, I think Eden Carbide paid about $400 million to resolve it. There's been a lot of dispute about whether they paid enough and stuff like that. But in any event, uh, one of the issues uh, that came up was whether the case could be brought into Texas and tried in Texas courts. And this was tried in the past, and it was permissible to bring cases from overseas into Texas and again to try and seek a uh, you know, beneficial or generous jury. Uh, the uh, law here in Texas has been changed where that is no longer considered acceptable. You have to have a significant nexus to Texas in order to prosecute a case here. But again, because of tort reform, it's become less attractive to bring cases into Texas anyway because people are not going to get these big uh, free-for-all uh, awards. So again, so one of the things we want to focus on is where is the case going to be heard? What are we going to focus on? So I want you to think about that. Um, remember at the beginning of the course, we talked about the difference between civil law and common law. As a practical matter, for our purposes, knowing that some countries are civil, uh, uh, the Napoleonic Code, of course, France, and some of the other countries, or common law, England, countries settled by England like the United States, have a common law system. In day-to-day -day law practice and day-to-day -day business, it doesn't really make a hill of beans difference whether it's a civil law or common law. Most of the countries operate, ultimately, your impact on you as a business person, pretty similar. So that's the key element. Uh, now, the book uses a little bit different acronym than we normally use. They're using the acronym IBE, International Business Enterprise. What is the normal acronym that we use? What's that? I don't know, I'm saying international business. Well, different word for international. Overseas, <laughs> foreign. How about MNC, Multinational Corporation? Yeah. MNC is the one that we actually use more. So I find it interesting. The book uses IBE, but you know every other book I've seen uses MNC, Multinational Corporation. So just to point out a little distinction. So for this book, it's going to be IBE. Uh, conflict of laws is what we we're talking about in our introductory comments. And we, we can handle this by designating in the contract, obviously, if we're the dominant party. We want to have it enforceable in the United States in the Texas courts in Houston, Texas, or the federal courts that sit here in Houston, Texas. Um, obviously, the problem is, is that if you're a little company or even a big company, but subordinate to a much larger company like a Shell Oil or um, you know, a country, company from overseas, then you're may not, in fact, you're unlikely to be able to, to negotiate to make American law apply or U.S. law apply. So again, that's going to be part of your consideration in doing business. Uh, keeping doing international business, and this, by the way, ties in with some material that we've already covered in the uh, corporation and business forms chapters earlier in the semester. So I just want to point out, we're going to go through this quickly here, but a lot of these forms are styles or structures of business that we already talked about, like joint ventures. We talked about joint ventures earlier in the semester, so the conversation really is, well, instead of a joint venture between two domestic companies, you have a joint venture. Uh, a good example is General Motors, opens a plant in China. In China, the government has 51% ownership of the General Motors plant. So General Motors wants to be in there, but the most they can control is 49%. There was a big follow-on issue when uh, with General Motors in China because General Motors wanted them to bring plans for the Chevy Volt over there, and Chevy didn't want to do that because they didn't want them to be ripping off the design and then creating uh, cars uh, manufactured in China that were not being made by General Motors using the same technology. That basically turned into a self-correcting problem, but not in a good way. And my recollection is the Chevy Volt was priced at $46,000 versus the most popular hybrid in the United States, uh, which is the Prius, which is, I think, priced at $28,000, $30,000. Uh, 
So the way they were covering that was just to say that you were going to get a tax benefit, and I think the tax benefit of buying an electric car is about six thousand dollars, but that still made the car about forty thousand dollars. It wasn't particularly an attractive car in contrast to the much more expensive Tesla, which uh, most people consider a very attractive automobile, also a really fast automobile, from what I've heard. And uh, so, uh, you know, there's uh, you know, a little bit different ways that we can uh, we can do uh, business. But again, I wanted to uh, mention a specific instance that I was involved in to talk about a little bit about international businesses that um, I was consulted by a company that does inspections on refineries. And they said, we have an opportunity to do inspections on a refinery being constructed in Russia. And we're thinking about doing this relatively small company, about like 50 employees. And so I said, well, let me see the contract. So I didn't need to refer it out to a specialist because it was so outrageous that I just point blank, I said to the client, I said, I really can't sign off on this. And I don't need to send it to an international specialist. It's so ridiculous that you don't need to worry about it. Basically, what it said is, the Russian company submitted this, so we want to rent your uh, international, your, your refinery inspectors, and we want you to send them over here. Uh, we want to be able to pay you in 60 days. and." Uh, We'll, uh, we'll, we'll decide when we're going to send you the checks and stuff like that. And I, said, uh, I said, first of all, you can't afford to do this deal. And if you do it, I'll tell you what the rules have to be because this thing is so far out that it's just a, it's an accident waiting to happen. And what they do is they use you for 60 days. You don't get paid. You finally stop having your people there. You've taken a massive loss. They repeat it with another vendor who's willing to fall into the same trap. So, uh, and, and of course, it was enforceable in Russia under Russian law and all that debt. So, I, I went back actually basically back through the same list of the following. I said, number one, your people don't leave the United States until round trip transportation is paid in advance, <laughs> until two weeks of pay are in hand, and the contract's enforceable in Houston, Texas. And I said, if they meet that, then you send your people over for two weeks. And if the check doesn't show up for the next two weeks, you pull back that same debt. Was what I said. You know, this is not complicated. But I said, you are too small a company to take a risk that you would have that kind of money floating around, especially in light of the fact that um, uh, Russian businesses don't have the best reputation uh, in the international community. So uh, it's. Uh, just very difficult thing. So, not surprisingly, the client company decided not to do business internationally. Now, there are ways to protect yourself. Another way is through letters of credit. Letter of credit works for where you deposit the money with the bank here in the United States. If you're, say, a Chinese company, you're buying scrap plastic and turn it into new plastic. So, you have a $100,000 purchase. So, it gets on a ship, goes over there, and they get it, and you say, Yup, ship showed up, and stuff's here. And so then the bank is uh, where you are is contacting your United States and they release $700,000 to you. So that's the way it works in a perfect world. Of course, sometimes stuff shows up and the recipient says, oh, wait a minute, this stuff doesn't look the way we thought it should look. It doesn't have the same melt factors and stuff like that. So there's still additional negotiations that sometimes take place. But at least you know that if you get it worked out, that the money's actually and you're not hoping that it's going to come in from overseas. So, that's something to keep your mind. Yes, sir. Sure. Uh, sure. So the case, for example, Darren Walsh Borders and uh, the Chinese world. Uh, yes. Like, for example, uh, John Provento, and then there was a, something similar that happened two years back. Yes. So like, for example, Chevron have to sell 51% of their assets in Venezuela to the government, right? Yes. Obviously, the price got the oil prices at that time that the government could afford it. However, if General Motors wants to dissolve or has a dispute with the Chinese government, uh, well, the, the, I mean, who do you take the government in front? I mean, is that a court to take a government to? I mean, is that other than, I mean, 
which is the parallel to the Uniform Commercial Code on sales, UCC Article 2. It's, it's an international companion to CISG, and again, we talked about that earlier this semester at the end of the contracts uh, section of the course. Uh, there's some other deals out there, obviously, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GAT. The United States has been a member of GAT about 20 years. Uh, this has certainly been a political football in this uh, most recent election season as to whether we should have, uh, you know, how our tariffs are set up. Uh, one of the big concerns about the tariffs is that we want to make sure that we are uh, being careful in how we apply them because uh, one of the things that made the Great Depression worse is that we put in a series of retaliatory tariffs that made it very expensive for other countries to sell in the United States. What happened is we created a cycle of all the other countries passed high tariffs to retaliate against the United States and make U.S. goods more expensive in their country. And it actually deepened and intensified the uh, Great Depression. So. Um, there's certainly a concern that while we want to make sure as many goods uh, are, are made here as possible to increase employment opportunities, we also want to be cautious not to create a trade war that would hurt the United States as well as other countries. And, you know, again, uh, we're always going to do best if we're in a healthy world economy and not just us. So, you know, pretty interesting uh, situation. Uh, one of the risks, and we talked about this with regard to China a few minutes ago, is that major businesses are expected to be partnered with the Chinese government. Uh, many other countries, the partnership can be uh, with uh, private industry, not with the government, so it depends on the way it's structured. Uh, nationalization and expropriation was mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, when Venezuela, under uh, Hugo Chavez, uh, jumped into the scene, uh, I don't recall how long ago, about 25 years ago. Uh, they uh, grabbed the uh, refineries and uh, they allegedly purchased them from the oil companies, but basically it would be a billion dollar refinery and they're getting like a million, ten million dollars is what I understand. They were paid dramatically, dramatically less than these facilities were worth. And so, uh, Venezuela has been on kind of a bad list uh, since then, and uh, Chavez is dead, but uh, uh, Maduro is uh, uh, slogging along down there, and uh, the country is continuing to go deeper and deeper into significant uh, financial issues. And uh, all I can say is if you were an American company doing business in Venezuela, I wouldn't right now be really careful because the uh, risks are so significant, especially if you were sending goods or money into Venezuela. I think you know, buying products in Venezuela, as long as you are protected on sales and stuff, I think you're probably okay. But sending money the other way doesn't sound like a good, a good, good opportunity. But anyway, we have to watch out for nationalization. And uh, a number of companies, have, countries have gone through this. Uh, the Brits uh, had nationalized a lot of their industries and then uh, realized the economy was flagging and the British economy has uh, been a pretty stable and successful economy and a lot of people attributed on the fact that they had enough sense to when they got far enough over the government owned operation they said you know this is really not working we need to make some of these things so they privatized or reprivatized uh, some of the industries and uh, have uh, been able to get their economy uh, reasonably stabilized so I don't think we're ripping over there for the increase in the well. Um, everybody needs to be uh, aware of different regional ones. Uh, I'm uh, going to be teaching international uh, ethics and law next semester for the Master in International Business program. And in selecting the textbook, the textbook actually picks <laughs> the European Union and China as specific chapters to help people reading the book look at specific applications of doing business either in China and the European Union. The European Union actually represents the market. I think even with Brexit, the market is still larger than the United States in terms of the number of uh, population. I think it's about, well, before Britain signed out, it was about 450 population, about 350 population in the United States. So it is a very large market. 
Um, it obviously has had its uh, challenges with several uh, member countries um, uh, struggling financially. Greece and Italy both had significant issues. And so uh, I'm not sure. It's, I haven't heard much lately, so I'm hoping both of them are reasonably stable. What's that? Not a stabilizing getting more stable. Yeah, I, I think uh, both countries have done things they didn't want to do, but they needed to do in order to get uh, more uh, international financing and support. So it looks like that's settling down a little bit. Uh, we talked about import controls, and again, uh, one of the classic examples of this that happened here in Houston was uh, crawfish. Crawfish, popular product here in the Gulf Coast, and uh, a lot of crawfish was coming in from China. And I remember this because I fixed crawfish at Tufay for my friends. And all of a sudden, crawfish was $5 for a package of frozen crawfish. And I was like, hey, this is a pretty good deal. Uh, and uh, then uh, that lasted for a year or two. And then all of a sudden, crawfish was uh, $9 or $10 for imported crawfish from China. And the Louisiana crawfish uh, were like $15, $16. And so I actually found out from somebody in the seafood business directly what happened. The Louisiana crawfish growers went to the Federal Trade Commission and complained that they were being uh, shafted by the Chinese selling crawfish in the United States for less than it cost to make the crawfish. So that is dumping. That's what you see on the slide here. Dumping. Dumping is selling product for less here than it <laughs> cost in your own country. So in any event, you know, and the reason to do dumping, of course, is to get control of the market, and then you can raise the price because you have, uh, you've made a big dent in the market. So in any event, what happened was is that the crawfish distributors here in the United States had to pay millions of dollars to the crawfish growers in Louisiana. Um, sadly, one of the seafood distributors was here in Houston. We won't mention them, but they are out of business because they got tagged up for several million dollars. And it's not really very fair because they were just an intermediary here in the United States, but they had to take the hit. But then, of course, they had no chance of getting that millions of dollars back from China. So China said, lots of luck, hope you make out, bye guys. And so, um, unfortunately, I know for a fact one of the Houston seafood distributors went under as a result of the uh, award in this case. So if you go in the supermarket today, it started to ease up a little bit. Crawfish were very expensive uh, for a while, but uh, they're dramatically more expensive than they were uh, back in the $5 days. So I think it's about $9, $10 for, for international and about, again, 16 or so for domestic. But uh, it's interesting because it's an example of going in and being able to say that our domestic industry is being injured by the way this was structured. So pretty interesting uh, outcome. Now, we've already talked about this. Export controls need to be very careful about how we move goods out of the country in case they're subject to some type of restriction. Uh, keep in mind that if you are a local company, you've got a product to sell overseas, that the US government wants to foster uh, international trade, especially sales overseas. And they will, uh, they are loan systems where you can borrow money in order to create goods that are going into the international market. Also, that you can get insurance from the federal government so that you know that you're going to get paid uh, or get some backup for it. So, kind of an interesting uh, approach. Uh, U.S. antitrust laws apply to American companies overseas. And they also, uh, U.S. companies can also be subject to antitrust laws in other countries. Classic example of this is U.S. has been done several rounds with Microsoft. Microsoft so far has made out okay as the uh, host, host country, but uh, here, but they were fined $500 million uh, by the European Union for antitrust violations. So, depends on which end you look at as to how these come down, and I don't know what's going to happen overseas with regard to Microsoft. Uh, 
one of the things is you do business internationally, you need to make sure that your books and records are uh, coherent under U.S. system and under other systems. You can't just say, oh, you know, we're, it's our way or the highway. You need to be able to show that your books are done correctly. Uh, another uh, issue here is uh, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Some of you were at our big business symposium on November 18th. We had two presentations by the Greater uh, Houston uh, Business Ethics Roundtable, acronyms Gerber, and one of the two Gerber sessions was actually just on the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Uh, the U.S. was considered a pioneer. A lot of people said our overseas business would just be dead if we didn't bribe people to get into countries. Actually, the opposite happened. Many other countries around the globe adopted similar acts to FCPA to make it illegal to bribe people in order to get business. So um, if everybody plays by the rules, it can certainly help. Uh, also, it gets to the issue of who gets the benefit of what's happening. So if you have some uh, greedy uh, bureaucrats that are in the system getting new Rolls Royces and hundreds of thousands of dollars, then that's money that doesn't go to the underlying consumers, to the underlying workers. So uh, some kind of interesting pieces of that part of the operation. Uh, you cannot give things of value, you cannot bribe people. However, unlike the British version of FCPA, the US version does permit you to do grease payments. Classic example of that, my sister did some uh, manufacturing in China with a client company and she needs to go to China. So she goes to the embassy in Washington, D.C. and uh, you, there's, uh, you enter and you have two choices. You can walk in on the first floor and you can sit there and wait all day for your work visa. You can go up the stairs, pay $100, and you can get your visa within an hour. That's a grease payment. $100 is a grease payment. Hmm. <laughs> Expediting fees, that's what they're called. Yeah. Um, Anti-boycott laws, a pretty interesting area. Um, classic example in this area is a fairly old case about 20 years ago now. There's an agency that was renting medical doctors. So if you needed um, a doctor to come do some research or do some emergency medical care, you could get a doctor to come see. A Jewish doctor applies to go overseas and uh, he does not get an assignment in a Middle Eastern country because they will not allow Jewish persons to be sent to that country. Uh, what happened was is that he then filed an anti boycott case and he prevailed in that case because the United States companies are not allowed to honor a discriminatory boycott from a third party country. Uh, now, my own approach is a little bit different. I think that uh, from a safety standpoint, for right, other reasons, I think I'd rather not see that going if I was a Jewish doctor, but again, it's the law versus the practicality. So I don't know whether you want any uh, financial rewards, but the, the decision said that if you are in a country that does not honor um, civil rights as the United States sees them, then you may not be able to do business in that country. 